Ladies and gentlemen, to facilitate the next panel discussion, access to data, leapfrog opportunities for startups globally, allow me to introduce Lisa Mitchell, the Managing Director for Kansas City Techstars. Thank you. And as she mentioned, we are going to open this session up to questions. Uh, the opportunity that we have here is to get to a more granular discussion on the topic of what is artificial intelligence, what is blockchain, um, what are we doing to enable entrepreneurs around the world. I hear some feedback. Uh, my name is Lisa Mitchell, and I'm the managing director of Techstars. Um, we have invested in more than 870 companies around the world and um, to date, those companies have raised over $3 billion. So we've seen a lot of crazy ideas, and many of those crazy ideas actually turn into reality. So our bar for crazy is, um, frankly, really low. We, we love crazy, um, love to find entrepreneurs that are doing things that people say aren't possible to actually scale. And so we've, I've, brought some friends here to join us. Um, Rishi took us into what does the world look like from Detroit to Mumbai? What are the similarities and what are the differences? And now we're gonna jump into opportunities that we're seeing, especially in the world of Africa, the continent of Africa, the, con um, the country of India, and much of the Middle East. Where are the opportunities to actually leapfrog over new technologies? And in many cases, these opportunities are opportunities that are easier to do here than they are in Europe, the US, places where there are a significant amount of regulations. And so first up, I'd like to welcome my friend Shivani Sharoya. Um, I have a lot of favorite entrepreneurs, but Shivani's on my top list of favorite, uh, which is why I've drug her from places to Omaha to here with us today to speak to you and help you understand how she is doing something unbelievably disruptive that everybody said couldn't happen. So Shivani, would you tell us a little bit about Tala, your company, um, where it's located, where you're operating, and specifically what are you guys doing to disrupt the market, um, especially that I have here sitting on my left in Barclays. <laughs> sure. Um, hi everyone, I'm Shivani. Uh, I'm so excited to be here. Thank you, Lisa. Um, so what Tala is doing is we're a mobile technology and data science company that is opening up financial access, choice, and control uh, to individuals around the world. So there's about 2 billion people currently that are underserved by financial institutions. And that's mainly because they lack what we call a financial identity um, or a credit score. And so we realized that it's not only that they lack this financial identity, but they're also really, really hard to reach. And that's mainly because of the fact that we don't understand what they're doing with money in terms of what they should, what they need to do, and what they want to do. And so we had to rethink not only how we understand these individuals, but also how we could reach them. And so we started to think about their daily life and all of the data that that daily life actually generates, rather than thinking about traditional data. Um, and so what we developed is a mobile app that is on smartphones. Um, and that mobile app actually allows us to instantly create credit scores using just the data on the smartphone itself. Um, and so to date, we've now delivered over one million loans in East Africa and Southeast Asia. We've had over a million people actually access the platform. Um, about 85% of our customers can literally register and get credit into their mobile wallets um, or their bank accounts in under two minutes. Um, and so what we're really excited about is really changing that relationship with these customers. So rather than thinking very transactionally um, about credit or financial services, we're really thinking about it as how do we actually develop trust and how do we actually develop that long-term relationship with them so that we can think about credit, but it's also other products like savings, checking, insurance, um, and bill payments. So I know that you're located in the US 
but where are your customers located and where is the majority of your team located? So we're headquartered in Santa Monica, California, uh, but we have an office in Nairobi and then an office in Manila. Um, most of our customers, actually all of our customers, are outside of the US. Um, and so our teams are distributed, um, and we really use this kind of model of like the hub and spoke model. But in addition to that, we have our team in Manila servicing customers in Nairobi and Tanzania. Um, we have you know, our team in Kenya actually servicing customers around the world as well. That's amazing. And I'm confident that many people told you when you started this process that it wasn't possible because of regulatory reasons. Is that correct? Yeah, I mean, I think it was regulatory. I think it was technology. They didn't actually think that people had access to this kind of technology. Um, and then, obviously, the idea of lending to people just using data on smartphones um, is pretty crazy as well. And, and if I have downloaded your app and I've been using it for a while and I want to borrow whatever, $5,000, how long does it take me to get approved for a loan? So that's what I was, it's about, uh, I mean, 85% of people will get credit in under two minutes. So, so two minutes, and then when do I get my cash? No, within that two minutes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, and so now I turn to you, um, Yasaman, who is the Chief Creative Officer at Barclays. And you guys have been funding a lot of really interesting technology in the AI space, in the blockchain space. Can you give me some examples of the kinds of things that, that Barclays is interested in? Because obviously you see models like this as disrupting to your business, but you must be able to do your own leapfrog in terms of, of um, new technologies that you're trying to invest in. Do you have favorites of your own? So I would say, Specifically for Africa, it's less about new technologies per se, but it's more about creative use of existing technologies. So we don't have to come out there and be the next geniuses in, you know, in artificial intelligence, but there is plenty loads of them already in the world. How are we really maximizing the use of them for our context, mm -hmm. for our customers, for our prospective customers? And this is where we started a very interesting journey since last year, um, you know, Craig Bond touched on that very nicely, how we have started building data capabilities to really make our banking experiences more predictive, to give the confidence to our customers to know who you are, every single touch point we have it with our bank, be it as a business customer, as a millennial, as a retail customer, that you really feel these are getting more personalized. Very interesting to what, you know, Shivani was talking about, key team for us this year, now migrating from having used existing technologies to solve for some of our experiential issues. We are now going to really widening the funnel for the millennials and the young generation coming in. It's, it's a very young population that we have on this side of the world. And um, traditionally, the way we run risk models, the way we lend products is actually still very traditional. And that's where mobile technologies can give us whole new data sets where partnerships really come to the table where we don't see ourselves as being the one that have to incubate the new technologies, but actually can we find the right partners to collaborate with and go and provide the right products to these millennials and that are coming in. So alternative lending is one of my personal favorites. I'm very passionate about it. And this year, we are working with startups from our own cohort, from our Techstars cohort that we you know, um, selected last year, but also internationally from our wider RISE program to go after millennials and use the likes of social data, Facebook data, Twitter data, to challenge ourselves of how we you know, assess these individuals and bring them in into building financial relationships with them. So we've already invested in them, and this year is all about actually going and scaling some of the work that we kicked off last year. Yeah, I think um, we hear frequently in North America anyway that it's that a lot of these entrepreneurs, they're the, I think Jonathan and some others mentioned it yesterday, it's the Snapchat founder, it's Mark Zuckerberg, et cetera. But I have a couple of examples that I think are um, Barclays investments of companies, Atlas Money out of Ghana, um, that is utilizing the blockchain. Uh, ben Ben out of Cape Town 2016, that's a working with the Ghanaian government to digitize um, land titles. Using I mean, blockchain again. Using exactly. blockchain again. So I think it's fascinating that coming from the other side of the, of the world, I'm seeing more blockchain technology 
here than we actually see there. And also artificial intelligence, so we have not per se incubated artificial intelligence ourselves, but we are using existing solutions out there. There is another very interesting company we've started working with, and also in the back of our accelerator program in Cape Town last year, which is called Asoriba. They have a mobile solution for church communities, and they essentially come and provide CRM solution to how to administer churches better, to uh, go out there and build that deeper relationship with members when it comes to gospel content, all kinds of you know, relevant you know, faith content. And on the back of that, also partnering with us and going and providing the right financial relationship for, because these are niche communities that have been untouched by us previously. And how can we, again, find innovative solutions out there where it's not necessarily about the progressiveness of the technology, but the use, the creative use of that to go after populations that have not been touched. And that's very disruptive. Yeah. And don't so. you have a specific program focused on African success? Yes. So we have a philanthropy project also that we've kicked off, um, going after communities and helping children in these communities um, engage their academic engagement. And we have done a global survey on that to understand some financial behaviors or also general behaviorals that financially successful people have shown in their lifetime that they think have led to their success. Mentorship has been a key, key finding on that. Diversified reading, uh, peer engagement, um, competitive sports, and specific on the mentorship, I think what we see in a lot of um, challenged communities here, 10 minutes of mentorship per day, and that can be even yourself having two mentees and, you know, in Soviet communities can potentially change the life trajectory of these children. And the only way to go after these kids and reach all of them with mentorship experiences. It's not a human army of mentors going out there to all the African countries. It's got to be via mobile technologies and artificial intelligence that provides personalization at scale. Yeah, that's amazing. Very cool. And again, the point I hope for the audience is we're seeing amazing entrepreneurs working on artificial intelligence, machine learning, blockchain, coming from everywhere in the world. And Ali, um, Ali, corporate vice president at Microsoft and a new role in disruption of the world. Um, <laughs> talk to us, I know for Africa is an, an initiative that you've been involved with, um, especially working in um, Turkey and Egypt where there's a heavy youth population that probably needs to focus on ed tech um, and solutions that we're gonna have. What's the role that Microsoft is taking working with entrepreneurs and what are amazing entrepreneurs that you're seeing? I think, um, I mean, one of my own um, very early learnings as I joined Microsoft 20 years ago was that many of the problems and many of the issues that we face in emerging markets, the West does not necessarily think about them. And then ideally what you want is if you, if you, if you, if you can support people with um, a combination of um, learning tools, environment, sometimes financing and so on, then you can address some of the really, you know, different and, and bigger problems. Um, you know, as a company that is primarily a technology company, we try to play around with different things and support, let's say, Millennium Development Goals and, you know, things like that. And it did not necessarily work as well for us as it did, for example, for the Gates Foundation. That's a very different thing. For us, sort of like technology uh, was the core. Um, the, uh, the for Africa, the for Africa thi thinking was basically saying, okay, let's try and address some, some big problems. Let's try and imagine Africa at a time where access is more affordable. That's access to communication, that's the cost of communication, access to devices and so on. Then we tried to think, okay, what if we make all um, the development tools available for developers? And then, okay, what if we, what if we moved closer to um, incubators and, and, um, and accelerators, then what happens? And, and then, okay, what about, what about training? If you're, in a, if you're in a difficult situation, you need the best of the best to, to address it. And, and, and therefore, we started thinking, well, what if we try and train people so that they are substantially better, as good or better than anyone from Microsoft or from any uh, multinational company? And over this, this last four years, I'm, I was very happy to see that from very early um, TV white spaces, affordable access, sort of like pilot, we have more than 15 today. We have a full-fledged service um, in, in Kenya that's run by entrepreneurs 
um, in Kenya, that's Moengo, uh, from dealing with one accelerator to dealing with maybe 14 or 15 today, from trying around with some, um, um, let's say, some um, uh, learning and some online learning. We've actually taken the Microsoft internal academy and tools and turned it into a Microsoft virtual academy in Africa or an Africa virtual academy. And I think now we have more than 700, 770,000 people um, um, trained and 1,500 companies touching that. And then after some time, as we started promoting and talking about that internally in the company, we realized that so many people in Microsoft want to be part of this. Um, and they kept on saying, well, I go to Africa to, you know, to volunteer in painting a house or in, I don't know, visiting a hospital. And we said, can you, and, and then we started thinking, okay, maybe you can give your time and do something a bit different. And um, some of our top engineering, technical um, researchers and, and, and business people from all over the world are now involved with entrepreneurs in Africa and with companies in Africa, uh, giving their time, um, contributing, but also learning a lot. I think now we have more than 400 volunteers from Microsoft. Our, our official volunteering time in the company, the time that we give you every year on top of your annual vacation is like three days. These are people who actually take from their own annual vacations and come and spend one, two, three, four, sometimes more weeks and, and wanting to come back. Um, solutions for government. Um, I'm sorry, you know, as uh, when an, you know, as an Egyptian, or as, uh, starting in Egypt, one of the biggest things that faces Egypt and faces many emerging markets is the issue of social subsidies. And the fact that you, the government has to basically subsidize goods so that people can afford it. But they don't know what to subsidize and how much. They were subsidizing gasoline and wheat. And I remember as a general manager of Microsoft Egypt 20 years ago, Microsoft gave me a company car, a good salary, the car happened to be an eight-cylinder car for some weird reason. Uh, for some, someone said that for security, it has to be a four-wheel drive, eight-cylinder car. Um, but anyway, uh, so I found out that if I actually move across the street or from Cairo to Alexandria, I consume subsidy on gasoline and on wheat if I stop to get the sandwich or go or get a croissant or something like that, that I don't deserve. Today, with um, with big data, internet of things, cloud computing, data sciences, you know, machine learning, advanced analytics, these issues can be solved. And, and again, the West won't think about it on its own. They, the solutions are going to come from here. Opportunities for you know, Africans to decide and address what's important for Africa and use the growing ecosystem in Africa and outside Africa, multinationals, locals, local investors, government support, and so on to do, to do much more. That's amazing. And, and I don't want you to, anyone to think that I'm leaving Arvind out. <laughs> um, I, I'm actually going to, Arvind's going to do an entire presentation because we decided to be entrepreneurial and figure out how to save time. Uh, so, so I'm not leaving him out and, and not asking him a next question. So I have a question for you, Shivani. Um, do we have my friends in the room from Angola? Hello? Yes, okay, you guys are being quiet and you wave your arms. So I, I want to give a shout out to Angola and use that as an opportunity to ask a question to Shivani and, and then Arvind, I'm confident, will address this as well. Um, I went to Global Entrepreneurship Week in uh, Angola this year. It was the very first time that they'd ever participated in Global Entrepreneurship Week. And today there are 15 entrepreneurs from Angola that are here for the first time at Global Entrepreneurship Congress, all who paid their own way to come. And it was, an, it, it was a country that, frankly, I didn't know much about. And I'm blown away at the opportunity in size, in agriculture, in a number of other things. So my question to you, Shivani, because there's many entrepreneurs that are here in the room, how do you, I want you to go to Angola, um, so you can tell this is my plea, but, but seriously, how do you make decisions about what markets you're going to go into next and, and how you scale as an entrepreneur doing something that's never been done before? So I think, um, so partly what we did was we broke it down into critical questions that we needed to answer internally uh, before we were actually ready to scale. 
right? So part of it is thinking that in our first market, which was Kenya, um, we focused only on the mobile money system because M-Pesa is so prevalent. Um, but for us to actually be able to scale globally, we had to prove to ourselves that we could actually also lend money using just traditional bank account rails. Um, so that was the second thing that we did. Um, I think the other thing is then thinking about regulations and thinking about, okay, how is a company that's, you know, I think a startup like ours that's pretty nimble and small right now, um, we actually, you know, can't go through the entire process of always getting a lending license. And so that then becomes a question of, do we go at it alone in markets where there isn't a lending license required? Or if we're going to go into a market, let's say, like South Africa, um, we would actually have to partner with traditional banks. Um, and that, again, is because of the fact that we proved we could actually lend through those rails, then it actually becomes a possibility. So I think partially it's like as we think about it, there is a set of questions that you always have to keep answering. But I would say the four major things are the regulatory environment, um, the smartphone prevalence in that market. That's our only dependency right now. Um, obviously, we're looking at demand for credit, so we don't want to go places that we're actually not needed. Um, and then the last thing is thinking about what is the actual data on the devices. And so we look at that as, is it similar to markets that we've already operated in and have algorithms and fraud models already working there? Or would we have to completely recreate um, everything from scratch again? And so that's your decision-making criteria. <laughs> and obviously, all entrepreneurs have to make decisions based upon the kind of technology that, that they're using in their market. And, and Yassi, I think we find the same thing. As I mentioned earlier, we're seeing entrepreneurs that might be born here that go to London to launch a company through Barclays. We're seeing entrepreneurs that might be born in Ghana that go to New York City. Um, is that like the future? Entrepreneurship is going to, doesn't matter like where you're from, you make decisions on, on where you want to go to scale your company. What, what is Barclays kind of view of this relative to Rise and the work that you're doing? So we are, we are very global, right? So for us, it doesn't matter which country you're from. Uh, the sort of, um, I guess, analogy I always look at, I'm like, when you go up there in a spaceship and you see the world, you don't see the frontiers of every country. It's just one globe. And that's, I, that's the way I see our RISE network. I say it doesn't matter whether you want to cycle through our program in New York or in Vilnius or in Tel Aviv. We are so closely aligned in terms of understanding our geographies and our continental need and our business need, obviously at the forefront, because there's always two sides of the story. We want to have a win-win equation where we are helping ourselves, our business, our customers, but also the countries we are operating in, you know, the macro societal impact is very important for us and we are at our hearts hence the shared growth agenda we are pursuing. So if you're an entrepreneur, for example, in London, we have that before, where we are now working with an alternative lender, and the company is based in London, but and sometimes you know, they come here, sometimes they don't. It's not necessary. You know, technologies these days make collaboration possible anywhere in the world. Um, I think in Africa, the only challenge that we have is, it may be a little bit of a cultural challenge at this point, yeah, that people still prefer to work face to face. And I think that's one of those that is, I think I've seen myself an improvement in the past two to three years, um, having worked on projects here. In the US, it doesn't matter. People are just all on Skype and FaceTime, whatever. It really makes no difference. But I think we're gonna that sh see that shift even much more in the next few years here, where anywhere in the world, for our next cohort that is starting in May, we've even had you know, companies apply from Indonesia, from Israel, even from Iran, <laughs> which is like hilarious. But I'm like, obviously they don't see challenges of wanting to collaborate you know, with a big bank and going after opportunities in Africa, so we definitely don't either. And um, as long as if for certain you know, opportunities that we wanna pursue here locally, and not from our side, but from the other client side, they may have to come in here. If you're supportive of that and they want to come here, then it's all fine. So it's a global focus. Open it up to questions. Um, and, and I'll ask the first question while you queue up. I don't know how you guys are planning to see people that have questions, um, but I see someone right here with a microphone. So jump in. Uh, hi, my name is Edzai Jobo from Maths Genius here in South Africa. Um, it's amazing, the India's tech. So is it something that uh, is transferable across geographies such that you can actually plug and play if you are to come to South Africa or any other country? Thank you. Do you want me to answer yeah. that? Okay. 
<laughs> that's I, can't, a very, that's, I can't answer. That's a very important question, my friend. And I, I think um, it's a question that many countries are asking across the world. The whole reason of doing this presentation uh, virtually was to, uh, uh, is to tell that this is a sandbox today. It can be applied anywhere, where the regulators, the government, and the innovators are all willing to come together. All you need, you don't, I mean, this is not a technical problem to be solved. This is a getting your ducks in line problem to be solved. You need to get your, as I said, your innovators, your, your, yeah. your, uh, the political capital, and the, uh, the uh, regulators all in place. We are ready to you know, work with governments across the world to do this. So it's a sandbox. OK, we have another question right here. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Olao Shibikon. I'm an entrepreneur from Nigeria. And um, my question is to um, Yasi Aspasil. <laughs> I'm really sorry, hard. If, I, I don't blame you. sorry if I messed up your name. Um, you are the chief creation officer, Barclays African Group Limited. Why are you not in Nigeria? <laughs> yeah. I would love to come to Nigeria. So I know, look, um, we have a rep office there, but we don't Sorry. have banking operations in Nigeria as of today yet. Hopefully, maybe it changes in the future, um, but not at this point. But however, having said that, for our Rise Hub or the Rise Innovation Center that we have in Cape Town and the Accelerator program that we're running with Techstars, we have many applicants from Nigeria. We've had previous companies also that made it through and that we've been collaborating with from Nigeria. So that part of the door is wide open. Uh, you as an entrepreneur, Actually. you know, you and should And to everyone, come. we hope we'll have your contacts displayed yeah. so that we will know how to contact you. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. We're all on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> and we're in Nigeria, by the way, just in case you forgot. There you go. Microsoft, <laughs> Microsoft is welcoming you in Nigeria. Everywhere. Okay, we have a question back here in the back. Good, good afternoon. My name is Mike Morris. I'm from Manico, a small enterprise in Pretoria. We have actually built a solution. So this is more of a statement than a, than a question. To onboard a customer, KYC, Rico Fika, biometrics, verification. Our biggest challenge is there is no platform like the one in India. So I do urge the government sector to relook at this because it's been a big stumbling block for us to get traction, especially in South Africa. We've had more traction in other countries in Africa than we have in South Africa. Okay, uh, really quick comment. Just a very quick comment on that. Uh, where were you from, my friend? <laughs> Pretoria, South Africa. Pretoria. The, the, the thing is, where you need to be very careful is that this has to be, the architecture can be done in a public-private mode, but the data has to lie with the government. Please understand, uh, the, the value of data in this is very, very high. Data is the new oil. And this data has to be controlled by, should I be, should be under the supervision of the government, not nobody else. That's my personal view. Data is the new oil. Everybody write that down. We have yeah. one last Can question. Can I just add to that? The only institutions that, that are we should do this. To... Uh, we should do this offline now, I guess. Okay. Hi there. I'm from Hyperion Developments. My name is Dimitri Artist. With regards to your stack, I just wanted to know what stumbling blocks or hurdles you encountered, because you managed to do that in a short period of time, and it's a huge task to get all these entities together. I think the biggest, uh, biggest, uh, um, biggest uh, effort in that was to build uh, the, uh, the biometric layer, the identity layer, because that is a physical process, mm. right? And to be done in a very secure and sustainable manner. As I just commented, it's a data, finally, uh, eventually you're storing people's biometrics. So it has to be done in a very, very secure uh, manner, and it has to be stored very safely. And the uh, uh, environment of trust has to be created. The biggest challenge has been to create that environment of trust, to empower citizens that their data is secure, they can do this transaction, they're not going to lose their identity. And that's, the, that's in my opinion, the, soft, the softer issues are bigger than the technical issues. Okay, thanks so much. Okay. And I, I just like to close and reiterate the comment that he just made. The entire point of this panel is that 
data is the new oil. Um, as Shivani stated, her company is a data science company, um, as is you know, Microsoft, Barclays, all both data companies now as well. Hopefully you'll take the opportunity to meet with all of the panelists that we have um, have had up here today, ask further questions of them, engage with them in any way that you can, and, and I'd love to take the opportunity to thank them for coming all this way to spend time with you. So thank all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.